whose contribution has been of great value. Robert H. Jackson, Nuremberg, July 26, 1946. Huh. I didn't even know he'd been that voluable. <laughs> and uh, and here's, a, Taylor. here's a full set of the uh, record of the first trial. Right, uh, of course. The and uh, has in it all the transcript right. of the hearings and then the documents and I'm all sure. that. Oh, no, I, know, I know it well. Uh -huh. uh, well, good. The, bl the blue set doesn't stay very blue over the years, is what I've seen. Obviously, <laughs> yours is faded. and Yes, it was uh, it's well used. Right. Made on the presses of uh, Julie Streicher. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and there you are at the podium. Yeah, that's when I was presenting the Fisher case. That's fantastic. Is that the, you know, you need more, I forget what that was. I thought you might want to come in just to see oh, this. Are you kidding me? Oh, this is Absolutely. Great. This is fantastic. Do you mind me just videotaping this a little bit? No. Wow. These are fantastic. I'm getting rid of books now. And his book, I mean, they have, they have different objectives. His book, obviously, is an, an encyclopedic account of the evidence. That's right. Yours is a... Uh, uh, it includes the evidence, but it obviously includes all the, the lawyering and investigating. That's right. Um, so they complement each other. Yeah, yeah. I... John, do you want something to drink? By Henry King. Oh, I. You may I have, have that. I have this, but I'm not sure. It's, I don't have that. I'm not sure that Greg does. So. Well, there you go, Greg. Uh, well, you are the best. Well, I, I. You can have another. Okay, that's great. Thank right, you. And Thank in, you. The <coughs> in the envelope is a little promotional pamphlet on my book. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, we were each uh, customers already. <laughs> yes, I imagine. And, and gracious customers, there, there was just terrific. What, what made you, what caused Drexel Sprecher at this stage of your life to do the compilation that you've done here? Well, uh, a good 15 years before um, I finished the book, I started writing something on Schreicher as the main Jubator and so on, and then I started doing something on one of the two defendants I tried, Von Schirach, the youth leader, and I found myself getting to such depth that I said, well, what the hell, why shouldn't I write a book about the whole thing? It took about ten years to uh, put that all together. Are you a are you a computer guy or were you doing this all on a typewriter? Typewriter on an IBM 50 Selectric. Wow. Wow. That's a that's a labor of love and yeah. honestly it's it was. It's easier to do it now on computers, but uh, Well, uh, of course I typed it up and then I had a, a secretary sure, sure. <coughs> who typed it into uh, <coughs> final form. That that the uh, university press wanted. Right, right. <coughs> well, let's go through, if we, for our, we're doing this for the Jackson Center, and uh, you're such an integral part of, a, such the famous part of Jackson's life, that uh, to get your perspective of not only Nuremberg from your, that you were there, but also maybe Jackson's participation in that is gonna be exceedingly important for years to come. Uh, and for, but your career path, Get us, get us to Nuremberg. Tell us about, uh, you know, like graduating from law school. But how did you work your way to getting to uh, that particular spot? Well, during the war, I had trained some anti-Nazi Germans to be, um, when I was with OSS, to be uh, people to be jumped in ahead of us when we invaded uh, Europe, <coughs> and. Uh, then I came back to the United States, and on uh, June 4, I picked up the paper, and here was Justice Jackson's report on his first visit to Europe. Right. I was utterly overwhelmed by it, and that same day I went back to OSS to the office of Jim Donovan, who was the general counsel of OSS, right. and I said, uh, 
Jim, I've got to get with this. And I told him a little bit about what I'd done. And, and he hired me right on the spot. He wouldn't let me leave his office. He sent me out to Chicago to get where I'd left some of my stuff. And I immediately began work uh, on, that, on June 4th. I'll be there. Yeah. So you, you were still in the military. You hadn't... I was still, yes, I was a captain in the military. Okay. Okay. And were you... OSS was going to be doing something with you, or were you on the brink of a civilian life at that point? Well, if not for him, I would have been retiring very soon from the military because I had much more uh, seniority than I needed. Right. But uh, I never thought another thing about it. As soon as I saw that that re uh, report in the newspaper of Justice Jackson, I tore back into it. and. Right. Uh, I was the uh, one of the first two lawyers into Nuremberg, and I was the last lawyer out four years later. <laughs> <laughs> and in the meantime, I became deputy chief counsel underneath Jackson's successor, and the editor in chief of these fifteen volumes, green volumes, right. called Trial of War Criminals. So, what, tell us about Donovan. Jim Donovan. Right. Well, he was an extremely uh, bright and um, able speaker and writer, and he very much impressed uh, Wild Bill Donovan, and he actually did a lot of the administrating and running of OSS underneath Donovan. Right. <coughs> and uh, one of my uh, one of my fraternity brothers from uh, University of Wisconsin was one of Wild Bill Jonathan's three administrative assistants. Oh, really? So I went right over to him, and he said, well, uh, let's not fool around. Let's go right down and see Jim Donovan. So we did, and he hired me that same day. Uh, did you have any interaction with Bill Donovan at all? Uh, you were one of the first ones at Nuremberg, so uh, Nope. Yes, I had to. Uh, he wanted. He asked me to get, for example, um, copies of all the oaths that were taken by, the, were given by different agencies, mm -hmm. both within the uh, Nazi regime and in France and in England and so on. And I had to present these to him. He had an office right next to mine, and. Um, Every now and then he'd say, Sprecher! <laughs> and I'd have to run some errand for him or do look up some documents that he needed. Then he, of course, didn't stay beyond the first week of the trial. Mm -hmm. He returned to the United States. I, know he, I think he and Jackson may have had some, I don't know about this for sure, but I think that there may have been a little tension that that Wild Bill expected to be uh, front and center more than what mm -hmm. Jackson was willing to make him. Right. Did you get any sense uh, regarding the uh, philosophical discussion of whether it was going to be more documentary trial as opposed to a, a witness specific trial? Was, were you part of that discussion at all? Well, I wasn't in on the top the discussion of the top people about that, but from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the feeling that we had such a rich access to documents, mm -hmm. and that these were historically important, and that we would rely more on contemporaneous documents than upon witnesses. Mm -hmm. There was a little dispute about that, and I think maybe while Bill Donovan was in on part of that, I think he felt that the witnesses would liven up the trial more. And Now, you're there literally in June. Uh, you're, in, you're in London? Yes. In London? Very short, briefly. In um, early July, I flew to London and met Jackson. I hadn't met him before then. And uh, <laughs> I had a number of prospective witnesses or affidavit givers from the trade union movement that had fled to London. I interviewed them and all. And then I went to Paris because Colonel Story, the Executive Trial Counsel, who was very close to, to, to Jackson, he had uh, passed through 
uh, Jim Donovan's office on the way over, and he said, I want you in my office. And I said, fine. So I then went from, uh, after I got to London, I went to Paris, and story that very evening, uh, that, well, late in the afternoon, uh, said to me, uh, these several research analysts we have, some of them from the American Embassy, um, are bringing me all kinds of stuff about the persecution and murder of the Jews, but they're bringing me nothing on aggressive war. Mm -hmm. And um, the Rosenberg documents had just been found and brought to Paris. Right. And so he said, I hope that you could go into them and find something on aggressive war. So I went out and had a drink <laughs> and came back uh, after, after supper. And as I looked at those rows of lights ordiners in which Rosenberg had very meticulously filed uh, his documents, there was one that was only half the size of the other broad ones. And it had on the outside of it, APA Norwegian, uh, Foreign Political Auslands Politisches Amt uh, Norway, Foreign Political Office of Norway. So I looked in that, and I found that Quisling had come down to uh, Berlin and met Rosenberg, and I, maybe that's where I forget. Um, <coughs> just before the invasion of Norway, and I. There were documents in there that his reporting that, uh, Quisling's reporting that to the uh, <laughs> Norwegians as well as to the Rosenberg people after a while. And that turned out to be uh, quite a find. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And who did you report that to then? Well, I, I the story was going to London uh, we'll within early the next morning. And so I managed to get in to him with this, and he was very impressed, and said, let me take that whole file. So he took the whole file, as well as the several documents before and after Quisling had been into Germany. And uh, he took them to London, and the research analysts there were very impressed by this book, of course, and it, it tied up some things that they hadn't had any access to before. And uh, well, that was that. That was the end of that volume. <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, you were, just to go back just a second, you saw Jackson's involvement the June 4th. Uh, you got involved with Nuremberg. What was your impression of Jackson at that time? In, in June of 1945, you'd not met him at that time, but just merely, what was the, what was the feeling, what was the sense in your legal community, for example? Well, I <coughs> I didn't meet him until I went to London. Right. And uh, <coughs> he gave a party, uh, had a number of us there, quite a large number of people. And uh, I, uh, by that time, had found uh, in a book back in OSS, I had found uh, the uh, order that the defendant Lai, Robert Lai, had made to, dis to seize the trade unions on May 2nd, 1933. Mm -hmm. And I uh, immediately had that transcribed, and I built a brief around that and some other things, which is the first brief that was circulated uh, among the prosecution. Ah. And um, um, I I didn't mention, I don't think, anything about that when I first saw Jackson that first time. Mm -hmm. Then I went back, I went to Paris and worked with Story for a, a week or two, and I had all this other stuff from the Rosenberg documents, and that had been, some of it had been sent ahead of me. And then I came back to London uh, in late July, and Jackson uh, congratulated me very much Thank on you. having, uh, <laughs> as if I had really and done everything to find the Rosenberg documents, whereas that was not true. Yeah. Oh, well, you found the document within the Rosenberg documents. That's right. 
was important with respect to Norway. Right. Uh, it, and the reason I, s I happened to pick that out is simply that that little volume I thought wouldn't be as hard to work on as these big uh, volumes that uh, Rosenberg had on every subject you can imagine. <coughs> Let me just ask a question. I don't think we've asked anybody, John, is when Jackson was appointed as the prosecutor, chief prosecutor, was there any discussion about whether there were better people than he or whether that was a good choice or a bad choice? I never heard anything about that one way or the other. Um, when his that June 4th report to the president came out, mm -hmm. it was obvious to me that he was one of the most er uh, eloquent persons and wrote extremely well. And I was highly impressed by that. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the theory that became, uh, became obvious as to how he had a conspiracy notion in mind and so on and so on. Uh, after I got into uh, Paris and brought back the Rosenberg stuff, why he was, that's when I really first got to know him, but not well. Uh, right. Uh, he was, he relied on Colonel Story to take care of all the documentation and the main preparations. Uh, Bill, Bill Jackson, his son, of, um, acted as a liaison a great deal of the time, and so when we had things we thought should be brought to Jackson's attention, we normally just brought them to Bill uh, Jackson's attention. Mm -hmm. Um, and did now almost, Story had one kind of corner of the trial and then Eamon had the, another part of the trial? No uh, Story was executive trial counsel in the trial but he'd been head of the documentation division okay. and he had had people like me Whitney Harris and others developed little briefs ah, okay. that Jackson used in getting ready to make his uh, first statement to the tribunal and uh, things like that. And um, uh, when I uh, Jackson didn't deal much with the uh, minor uh, junior attorneys. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we dealt with Bill Jackson or we dealt with Story uh, about the preparation for the trial. Right. Now, Eamon comes into it only as the chief of the interrogation division and uh, we, when we wanted someone interrogated, even though his representative knew nothing about that area, we'd have to brief one of his people about what we wanted to talk about, sure. and we'd have to sit in the back of the oh. thing while he tried to do his best to get this out, and it was often terrible, actually. Uh, Eamon should have made arrangements so that he could take people from the documentation division and temporarily incorporate them right. into his operation very closely, but instead there was kind of a wall there, and we had to go through that formality, and we, the result was not always happy. Was that a strain at all between the, the documentation people and the interrogation people? Like you said, it, it was as you were trying to develop a case. I think we there wasn't so much an individual strain as there was a feeling that this could have been organized <laughs> better. Right. You were then assigned. You, you got assigned. Uh, Robert Lade was one of your first assignments. Since I way back. In Washington, I had started to work on the Lie case. Uh, I went in to see um, the head of research and analysis. Can't think of his name right now. <clears throat> I went in to see him, and I said, "I'm thinking of doing a, th a whole thing, a brief on this, taking over the trade unions, the formation of the German Labor Fund." He reached behind himself, he pulled out a book, he opened it to an appendix, and there was the order. Uh, for the taking over the trade unions from Robert Lyon. You know, I just shook my head like this. Franz Neumann, Franz Neumann was the guy in OSS. And uh, 
so this gave me a really concrete thing to show Jackson and then this little brief that was circulated. So he probably got to, to hear of me as, as much as of any of the junior sure. attorneys. Uh, so at Nuremberg, you, you thought at least that that would be your initial uh, case would be Robert Lay's first uh, Yeah, picture. yeah. And then one day I'm sitting in my office <coughs> early in the morning and in comes a friend of mine, Fred Niebergall, and they have some black on, and they're singing uh, some song that has to do with death. And uh, they say, poor Sprecher, he is left without his defendant, and so on. And that's the first I heard of it, okay. that Eli had committed suicide the, the night before. <laughs> so that ended my first <laughs> defendant. And a little later on, the story assigned me to to work on the case against Hans Fritzsche, the main radio propagandist. Right. And uh, then he assigned me to the case against Balder von Schirach, which really wasn't fair because Hartley Murray had prepared that case. and He was a major and he was very able. And uh, later on he, be, he be did some good work in the trial, but Story wanted to reward me. <laughs> Or something or other. Right. So he gave me two cases. I was the only assistant trial counsel that presented a case against two defendants. Right. Did you have uh, talk about the time you had to prepare for ones? For, so when you were told you got Fritchie, and how much time did you have for preparing it? And did you have a staff to assist you in preparing for the Fritchie case? Uh, the only the only staff I I had. <coughs> was one research analyst, and who that was changed from time to time. But uh, you could call on anybody that scattered around in the documentation division if you wanted them, and uh, they'd come and work with you right. on different things. It was a, a very efficient, informal arrangement, really. <coughs> um, on the Fisher case, the Russians had gotten, they turned over two defendants to the, for to be indicted. One was Hans Fritsch and the other one was one of the two naval officers, the top ones, I forget now okay. which one. <coughs> and uh, Fritsch was way down compared to almost any other defendant. He was, there was Goebbels and then there was an assistant to Goebbels and then there was the head of the radio division which was Fritsch. And so he was down, you know, and the Russia, Russia, the Soviets presented a confession they'd gotten, and uh, it was a, a very brief one about his having worked against the imperialistic, capitalistic, nasty people, and he therefore broadcasted all this stuff, and he'd gotten his orders direct from Goebbels, and that was about it. And Colonel Story and Colonel Wheeler, who was uh, Colonel Story's assistant, they just didn't like the sound of that statement that the Russians brought from him. And so we got talking and they said, Sparker, do you think you could work on this? So I was assigned to the, the <coughs> Fritcher case. Bob Kempner, who was the liaison of the prosecution with the defense counsel, mm -hmm. called me up one day and said, the attorney to uh, Fritzsche would like to talk to you. His name is Hans Fritz. I said, send him up. So Hans Fritz said, I feel, and I think the other defendants, uh, counsel to whom I have talked, that uh, Fritz is really way out of this thing. Uh, he's just not of, of the caliber the rest of these are. And he's willing to answer any questions that you put to him provided he can make his explanation as to why and where and all that at the same time. Sure. And I said, well, let's try it. And he, he said, there's just one thing. If we do that, I don't want you to introduce that Soviet uh, statement. Let the Soviets introduce it, but I don't want the Americans to introduce it. And I said, fine. So I would submit questions to him, and he would take them to Fisher, and Fisher would write out long explanations. And then we'd consolidate these, uh, and finally made one very long affidavit of 25 or 30 pages, 
which I introduced when I presented the case against him. Uh, and it was uh, generally felt that uh, this is a pretty unusual situation. Well, yeah. <laughs> and everybody just knew he was not of the same caliber or t degree of importance as any of the other defendants. And of course, he was found not guilty. One of the three defendants found not guilty. You think that was uh, appropriate? Yes. Who, who felt strongly about charging him? The Russians, the Soviets. Okay. Yeah. But on the American side, does somebody Not acquiesce, or the fact that they had custody meant that they got to decide that he would be part I, of I, this? I, I, my feeling is that at Jackson's level and a couple of the other people who were helping him, like General Telford Taylor and um, Heyman, that they had the feeling that uh, Fisher should be kind of left alone and not pushed very much because they thought he was just not a threat. It was a mistake that he'd been mm -hmm. put in and so on. Right. And when they were deciding on the defendants in late September, early October 1945, the uh, Russians just brought these two people and said, we want them in the in to be indicted. Right. And right. Everybody agreed. Okay. Who's the other one? I forget now. What? Raider? It was either Raider or, or Dennis. I forget which. Yeah. I think it's Raider. Raider? I'm not, I'm not positive either. It's one of the naval officers. It seems to me it's Raider too, but I'm not sure. Yeah. What were the circumstances then around you being assigned uh, Chirac? Well, partly because uh, I was very because Colonel Story thought a great deal of me. And I don't think he knew Hartley Murray very well, who had prepared a very good uh, statement on, uh, kind of a little brief on uh, Chirac. Mm -hmm. And one day, Story, uh, after I'd already been assigned to the Fitcher case, Story called me in, and there was Hartley Murray sitting with him. and. Uh, Story says, Harley Murray's done a hell of a job preparing this case, but I'd like to have you present it. He was there. I felt very embarrassed because I thought Harley, of course, should be assigned it. And that's how I got the, Fritch, the uh, Von Schirach case. And what was Murray's reaction? Did he ever speak to you privately about that? No, he was, he was a very um, reserved fellow, and he didn't show any feelings much when he may have blinked a little bit or something, but uh, apparently Story had told him in advance that that's what he was going to do, and there he was in the room while Story told me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. What did you think, when, after you presented the case of Sherrick, what was your feeling towards the guy? I mean, in one sense you had a job to do to present the evidence, but did you have a personal reaction about him? Well, I thought he was... <coughs> Uh, very guilty, and I was, I was, I expected he was going to get sentenced to death. <clears throat> I concluded my presentation to the tribunal with a written, uh, with a uh, newspaper account which quoted him as making the following statement, if um, I were to be charged with having sent thousands upon thousands of Jews from Vienna into the ghettos of the East, I would consider it a great compliment. Oh, wow. And with that I ended my, I quoted it and said thank you very much to the tribunal and sat down. And I thought that, you know, having said that as the Gauleiter of Vienna, that he'd sent thousands of Jews into the ghettos of the East, he claimed that he didn't know that they were being killed. Uh, uh, and we had no specific proof that he knew that. And he claimed, you know, this is all highly secret, etc. Right, right. So that's, that's that. Would you like a glass of water or anything? Uh, that would be great, yeah, if it's, okay, if it's, it's easy. Still. Okay. Whoops. There's a couple of uh, experiences 
probably individual experiences that, uh, uh, that you'd like, I'd like to have you talk about. One is you had the opportunity to accompany Claude Pepper. Yes. How did you know that? You read the book. No, no. Actually, I read another piece. So I was doing a little homework on you. Mm hmm. Well, <clears throat> Bill Jackson um, often asked me to do little things. And one was um, after the first or second day of trial, he said, to, We're now ready to have Senator Claude Pepper sit at the prosecution table. And we'd like to have you sit with him and to brief him about uh, the content of whatever's going on and so on. So um, I did. And uh, while uh, he and I were sitting at the prosecution, I noticed Gehring scribbling, and he broke his pencil and he threw it down on the dock. So I went up to the guard and I gave him another pencil that I had, and I said, Gehring broke his pencil, let him have this one. I went back and sat down, and then a recess came, and Pepper and I were standing between the prosecution table and the <coughs> podium, mm -hmm. and uh, someone said, Gehring is trying to get hold of you. Uh, I said, well, to myself, hell, we're not supposed to talk to the defendants uh, when they're in the dock. But I turned and he was going over and he, I went over to him and he said, Danke viel Maus, Danke viel Maus. Uh, and I said, a bit of sir, a bit of sir, you know. Uh, he, he said, thank you very much, thank you very much. And I said, oh, uh, you're welcome, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. And that's the only interaction I ever had with Gehring. <laughs> 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 right in the front of, of uh, the senator. <coughs> the senator, and the senator said to me, do you, uh, does that happen very often? I said, I, it never happened before, and I don't suppose it will happen again. <laughs> Prior to the trial, did you have any reason to interact or in interview any of the defendants? Prior to the trial? Yeah. Oh, no. no. That was a whole separate unit that did the interrogations. Well, that was, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the, uh, Eamon just never called on any of us to do any yeah. interrogating. While there, did you come across it? I'm just going to throw out a name here. A guy named John Gillen, or John Dolloboy. Uh, Gillen was his pseudonym. Uh, his actual name was John Dolloboy, who subsequently became an ambassador in Luxembourg. But he was a uh, an interpreter and uh, did some interrogations. Of Robert Lay. And in fact, it, that one long statement uh, that he, Robert Lay made that he tried to cut a deal, uh, it was Gillen that was part of that. Did that name ring any bells? At all? No, I, I, it, it, it does it almost, but it, yeah. not really. I can't figure, <coughs> I can't see his face or anything like that. Okay. <coughs> He's uh, still alive and in uh, Oxford, Ohio. Oh. And often speaks about his day. He was at Ash Camp. He was at. He was there. Did the one of the five interrogators there at Ashcan? In fact, you have a funny story about Ashcan that I, I read someplace. What? You, what, what? Give me a tip. As to what you? I'll mean. give you a tip. I think it had to do with. Uh, let me see if I can quickly find it. Uh, God, you're well prepared. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. Obviously. Uh, This, this is a question that somebody asked you about the funniest thing that happened during the trial. And you said, one of the funniest things that happened during the trial is right on the record, a fellow by the name of Von Steingrock, I believe. Steingrock, yeah. Steingrock. And he was asked by Colonel Amon if he had been to the Ashcan. And uh, Ashcan was the name of a detention center where many defendants had been. And when Amon asked him about that, the translator translated, now you, now you were in the you know, ash can, I guess, apparently, that you were incarcerated in the ash can, uh, and everybody burst into laughter. Yeah, uh, Did that ring any bells? Yeah. What was that all about? 
What? What was that about? Was that? Well, Ash can translate into the German. <coughs> uh, it came out something like, "Were you you ever put in a container?" Oh. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah, I get it. And uh, uh, he said, "No, I was never. I was never put in a container." <laughs> During Nuremberg, did you guys have a sense of history that you were part of something extraordinary? Oh yes, <coughs> I think so. Yeah. And Jackson, from the beginning, cast things in terms of the long-range meaning of things, and uh, we all identified very much with that and appreciated his the way he did it, and that we were a part of it. There was, there? there was one thing that I <coughs> didn't mean to say here. I didn't mean to say. Damn it, I forgot what it was that I wanted to point out. <coughs> um, The fact that uh, in OSS uh, I had found this, or I had been given this document on the destruction of the taking over the trade unions, was one of the very specific contemporaneous documents which was first circulated. And it, it, uh, my little brief there made quite an impression, and uh, it was really uh, not that important, but it was just one of those things that uh, right place, right time. It hits you at the right place, right time. Right. Right. Well, and didn't Jackson point to that as a model, the kind of work product that was useful? I I I know that he he mentioned it, the brief to me that the, and that he knew it was being circulated, but I'm not certain that. He's the one that said it should be circulated. Okay. It could have been Story or okay. someone else. Okay. Probably Story. Were you there during the opening statement? Yes, indeed I was, and I can tell you where I was. <coughs> I was in the very back part of the uh, chamber, right. way up on the balcony, and I had a pass, and I was glad to have it. And all the big shots were down on the floor, and all the newspaper people of importance. But by the time of the final statement, I was sitting at the prosecution table <laughs> within two seats of Jackson. <laughs> so that kind of moved up, you know. <clears throat> what was the sense, the beginning of the trial, the tr trial of really the century, uh, among the prosecutors? Was, was there a sense of electricity among you folks Anticipating the beginning of something? Oh, yes. I, th I think that we knew that <coughs> the trial was uh, going to get a lot of attention. Uh, I think we thought it would get more attention than it got <laughs> for a few years after the, the, the trials in the <coughs> early 50s and so on. Back here in the States, there was just no mention of right. anything about it. Then all of a sudden, it got more mm -hmm. popular again. <clears throat> but we thought we were definitely a part of something glamorous and important. Did you get? Did you? Were you able to eyeball any of the defendants during that opening statement? Was there any reaction that they displayed? Well, being way in the top of the balcony, I wasn't in a position to be very close to them. There was a, a good hundred, hundred twenty-five feet between me and them. But. Uh, um, I think I think that by that time <coughs> they'd begun to get from the indictment, which is pretty long, you know, 75 pages. Right. They'd begun to get a, a picture that the trial was going to go into great detail. Right. So and my guess would be that they weren't too surprised mm -hmm. by Jackson's statement, except I'm sure they, uh, most some of them, 
the were linguists, uh, appreciated that there was a man who really knew the, knew the language. And then here you are, we fast forward to the closing statement when you're two people from Justice Jackson, which is, did you get that same, look at the panoramic view of the defendants ten months later, what, what did you see that was maybe different? Did you see that they were, they felt they were beaten? <coughs> Hmm. Um, I don't know. I <clears throat> I assumed that they were, when the documents were being introduced, it involved particular ones of them, that they were very <clears throat> concerned in how it was being used and what was being said about it and so on. But I never thought of it much beyond that. Uh, it seemed to me that they, for the first time all of them were lumped together in that closing statement. In the closing statement? In the closing statement where you know, here Jackson's going right down the dock, you know, one at a time, but they're all together. Yeah. Uh, and you had a bird's eye view and I was just curious whether the defendants as they were being pointed out, you know, Gehring this, Hess that, Riebertrop no. that, whether they had any reaction. I, I didn't notice anything special. Yeah. Sorry, but no, no, no. <laughs> this is what's a, this is what's the fun part because <clears throat> were you, you were there. Were you on Jackson's side of the table? In other words, back to the defendants, or were you uh, across the table, facing the defendants? I think I was across the table from him. He was on the right side. Right. Tom Dodd was on the left, side, and I was behind Tom Dodd. Beyond yeah. Dodd. Okay. As a matter of fact, I think I got the picture of that in the book. Okay, <laughs> That's, I thought so. Yeah. Uh, what What was the pattern of your interactions with Jackson? Were you seeing him? Infrequently, well, very infre infrequently. Infrequently, okay. Yeah. He relied greatly on Colonel Story and then his son. When I made my presentation, Jackson wasn't even in the room. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But there is a uh, there's a picture of me making a right. my presentation. That's the one you saw in right. in the other room too. <laughs> you were we, you were also in the courtroom the day they showed the film. What was that like? Well, it was an incredible film, right. and uh, it showed, among other things, <coughs> the uh, condition of a number of concentration camps after the Americans moved in, and uh, I think it was so horrible that even many of the defendants, who of course hadn't been shown the exact things that were happening in the concentration camps, that wasn't the business of most of them. Uh, I think they were uh, moved by it too. But again, I didn't particularly register a, a reaction. Were you, were you part of the tactical decision that the prosecution made to to play the film at that point? No. Is it kind of it jumped out of order, didn't it? Didn't they kind of move up the film to maybe pick up the pace or increase the impact of what the evidence was accomplishing? I don't remember. Okay. okay. As you reflect back on the prosecution and the, some of the decisions were made, were there some mistakes made? Yes. Matter of fact, I have some of them listed in the mm -hmm. front of the book. Mm -hmm. I don't remember all those that I listed there, 
But, um, of course, I think one of the mistakes was indicting Fritchie, mm -hmm. just too, too small. Um, what about the massacres? The fact that that was limited just to the German prosecution? Well, how the Katine, the how Katine massacres? The, the Katine massacres? Yeah. Oh, that was certainly a... Uh, a mistake, <laughs> um, but uh, as you know, the uh, uh, Americans, the British, and the French just laid their hands off of it entirely and left it up to the, the Soviets to handle that. And uh, <clears throat> what do you think about the prosecution of Schott? <laughs> Well, at the time, my notion of, of guilt <coughs> uh, ran back to the early support of Hitler mm -hmm. uh, between 1933, or even before that, up until, uh, well, all the way through. And Schacht, of course, had helped bring Hitler together with von Papen to work out the, <coughs> uh, the Nazis uh, getting the Reichswehr Chancellorship and all that. And um, uh, it was, that was just another piece of detail that, that just kind of intimately had something to do with the uh, shock. But shocked became disillusioned and, of course, got into a scrap with Goering. And Goering was pushed into the becoming, in effect, the main person in charge of the economy of all Germany, not that he had all the titles, but that he was the man everybody knew was making the, the decisions on that. And uh, Schock uh, not only got squeezed out, but he retired to his, uh, to a place he had some miles from, from Berlin, and just never came back into Berlin or had anything to do with any of the other defendants, as far as I know. Um, and uh, in about 1943, Hitler suspected him, well, in connection with the attempt on Hitler's life on July 20th, 1944. Uh, they suspected Schock may have had something to do with some of those military people. Schock had been relatively close to some of the military people. Right. And so he was shoved into a concentration camp and <coughs> was actually in uh, Dachau concentration camp at the time we took it over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so here we were indicting a guy who had been put in the concentration camp. <laughs> camp right. But at the time, when you say your notion of guilt ran back to the early days, it, yeah, I, it added up for you. Yeah, I, I didn't know much about the details of what he'd not done, mm -hmm. but it's very plain after the trial was well underway and as we heard his case that uh, he'd he just retired from the picture. Mm -hmm. And so he, he was not a part of the, he got none of the documents, uh, any reports uh, of Hitler's conference, uh, says, uh, where he actually laid out plans for invading Poland and so on. Schock was just not a part of that. Yet obviously Jackson felt very strongly about that. Well, we all felt, I think, yes, he did, and I think that. Most of us felt that anyone who was as close to the total conspiracy or the total course of events as to help us have to have helped Hitler get to be chancellor, mm -hmm. that we figured, hell, mm -hmm. uh, he must be a very guilty person, and we didn't take the time to pull ourselves back enough to judge more accurately that there was a guy who had really re gotten out of the picture. So on reflection, when you look back at the acquittals, that um, either you were not surprised or not upset when Fritchie and, uh, and Schock perhaps received the uh, decisions that they got. 
Well, at the time, I understood the dismissal as to shock. Uh, as to Fritcher, I was upset. Were you? Yeah. You know. Von Poppen, I, it wasn't important to me one way or the other. Right, right. You were um, there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say that I had a few little tasks to do which were kind of important. Sure. Uh, after Major, Major Baldwin and I, later Colonel Baldwin and I, went into Nuremberg in early August 1945. And the first thing we had to do was help clean up some of the rooms and we had a whole bunch of SS members assigned to us and they were in there with their their present commander supervising them of course and they helped clean up the uh, palace of justice and move the, the books around and things like that uh, I, I thought that was very funny to be working there right beside a bunch of SS guys yeah, isn't that something? and uh, uh, somebody in the in one of the rooms had moved out a a long box which had files in it and uh, they were going to take that and put it down the basement or something or other else and I looked at it and I realized that this was the it had in it all the, re the reports or the uh, of the indictments that were important of uh, uh, Germans during the whole period of 33 to 39 uh, now it isn't that that's helped much on war crimes, but and here was, it was terribly important to have this preserved for German justice so that they didn't lose all that, you know what I mean? So I immediately grabbed hold of that and put it back and had it sent to the local Germans who were taking over that kind of thing very early. Um, and I remember how we got a letter from them and a lot of praise for having Save that and send it to them. <laughs> uh, and then I was in charge of um, of creating the first library uh, after we got into Nuremberg. Uh, I set aside, had a room set aside, and I went over to Erlangen, where there was a ch chief librarian who had been was very able and he was somewhat anti-Nazi, had been, and he readily agreed to uh, loan us anything that he had in, his, in uh, the airline and library to put in there and so on. And as a result of all that from his point of view is that at the end when we were disposing of documents in 1948 9 I saw that the University of Erlangen got a full set of everything, and of course he was very pleased. You uh, had an opportunity to get away during our weekends uh, from Nuremberg. What was, what was the city like at the time? You're there during the trial, outside the courthouse. Describe the scene of Nuremberg. Well, between the courthouse <clears throat> and the Grand Hotel, which must have been nearly a mile, was um, if you went back to the north, you hit the ruins of the old city. Right. And uh, you've seen the pictures of that. It was really, there were very few buildings where there was any rooms left. Uh, <coughs> I remember having going into one of them where there, uh, we had some contact with a German woman who worked for us and she asked us to come in. It was amazing, I heard the, the little building that she was in it had, which, in which several rooms had been saved was about all there was. The rest of it was just flattened out and bombed and all the rest of that. They, slowly began to clean it up during the four years I was in Nuremberg, but uh, it was still pretty rough shape in 1948 when we, I left. 
Did your paths cross Ray D'Addario's? Ray, the photographer? Yes, Ray and I were fairly close at the time, but we became much closer afterwards, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of the Nuremberg reunions, he brought down his pictures and put them up on the wall and all that kind of thing oh, and great. was very helpful. Uh, and he and his wife, Marguerite D'Addario, and uh, Virginia and I, insofar as we'd worked around a couple of the reunions, were rather close. In between, why, we, we haven't seen them. I haven't gone up to his place and he hasn't come down here. Well, He's a great guy. He's really a, a dedicated uh, picture taker. And I've seen his book, the one he published in 1994 in Germany, and it has a number of his colored pictures, uh, which was, I'm sure, a rather novel concept. He put, published several books. Yeah. yeah. Um, of photographs. And I, I did have them in the other room there, but I've sent some of them down to my daughter, and so I don't know that they're there now, but he's a great guy. I was reading a book, and there was a reference to a party on January 26th, 1946, at Maxwell Fife's house. And it says here, the party was a roaring success, and after dinner, a quartet of British prosecutors <laughs> singled out the energetic Drexel Sprecher for a song. Do you remember that? Yes, indeed. <laughs> what was that all about? Well... I had uh, worked r relatively closely with some of the British <coughs> uh, people, and uh, I'd gone into Sir David Maxwell Fife office and told him, look, you're getting ready to, one of your people to cross-examine one of the defendants and so on. I just wanted to be sure that you had all these documents because some of them get missed by now and then. He appreciated that very much. <coughs> so at that party, I don't know how the British became involved, but someone had had written that uh, book about old man's uh, a poem about old man Sprecher, that old home wrecker. Uh, I, I think it's quoted there, maybe. Yeah, it says, "Old man Sprecher, that old man Sprecher, his hands keep waving, he keeps us slaving, he keeps on hollering, and we keep follering all along." You know. Yeah. Well, I had um, I had actually become. Um, of the junior prosecutors, I'd come to have more people under me. Uh, that leads to one other thing you may want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 just uh, uh, after the indictment had been issued and before the trial began, I uh, <coughs> was talking to a number of fellows and I said, uh, there's going to be other trials here. Do, what, how do you feel about it? You, what, you interested in, in joining with them, uh, joining with the prosecution staff. And they said, oh, yes. So I wrote a memo to Justice Jackson in which I said, I and six other people would like to be considered whenever planning is done about the subsequent trials because we'd like to, to be here. The next thing I heard about that was an order that was circulated to everybody which said, Drexel A. Sprecher is hereby designated as chief of the subsequent proceedings division. <laughs> and uh, so I, I had that title as being director of the subsequent proceedings division up until I became director of about four other different things, the economics division, IG Farb and trial team, and the documentation division, which published these things, which yeah. uh, put together these green volumes. So. Um, and at the French Club, where we had a number of evening meetings and uh, drink and had, had a lot of fun, it was off to the side of Nuremberg. Uh, a number of times I sang with the French and all uh, with the British, and we just kind of had friendly times together apart from work. Now, you also were involved in obtaining some uh, 
documentation for the cross-examination of Ribbentrop. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, mean, I guess that followed the case, uh, the cross-examination of Gehring by Jackson. Well, you're right on top of things. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that, that segue. Jackson uh, was not a good cross-examiner. You know, there's a difference between being a great lawyer and being able to cross-examine, and apparently he hadn't had much experience. And <coughs> so the way he asked his questions enabled Gehring, <coughs> who's a very smart man, to um, kind of seize hold of things, and it um, uh, kind of embarrassed uh, Jackson in front of the tribunal, and uh, Biddle even mentions it in his book, his uh, Judge Biddle mentions it in his book that Jackson didn't have a very good time with Gehring. So,